Here it didn't seem to matter who you were, nor where you came from. They were all mates, bonded by a fortune hunter's search. Our past still lives. The ground is alive as it breathes memory from survivors. Metal detecting for relics is like hunting for gold. You never know what will turn up. Sometimes, out of left field, an unexpected hoard rewrites history. A veritable treasure trove in documents and handwritten accounts now brings Bernard Otto Holterman back from the grave. His short life was packed with creative innovation. A typical immigrant gold seeker from Germany. Arriving in 1858 on his 20th birthday, able to speak a little English, Holterman partnered fellow countryman Lewis Byers for the journey of a lifetime to Hilland. A visionary will rarely be recognised during their time. Only with the benefit of hindsight can we appreciate the genius that made them special. This survivor, entitled How to Teach Germans English, suggests an ability to turn a bad situation into a big positive. Hilland had many a German who, like Holtemann, struggled with the new language. The opportunity was seized, whereby he set up a school to teach English, effectively getting paid to learn himself. He mastered English and mocked it to a point whereby his youngest son had a riddle of a name, St. Leonard's Leichhardt Ratchford Holtemann, a Christian name conundrum. In 1861, Byers and Holtemann had a claim on the side of Hawkins Hill, a surface crushing provided funds to start things off, but it was a rocky start with both partners taking on jobs elsewhere. It may have been his ability to see an opportunity for what lay around the corner or a constant belief in the mine, but something prompted him to borrow funds. This original German loan contract organised by his father in 1867 for 7,500 marks says he had a plan. Holterman had now come of age. While the mine was still a priority, he purchased land, the All Nations Hotel, entered into business agreements and got married, preparing for the boom to peak while keeping one step ahead. In 1873, Holterman expanded his empire by purchasing land at Crow's Nest, which he affectionately called the farm. From here, he bought a place at Lavender Bay to greatly modify a bungalow into a mansion complete with 73-foot high tower, forming a photographic tripod in readiness for another world record. Wednesday, 1st November 2017 the Mitchell Library announced in the Sydney Morning Herald. Three of these images have been recognised by UNESCO as the world's largest 19th century wet plate negatives and for the technological achievement they represented at the time. Each is the size of a contemporary widescreen television, yet the plates were made less than 40 years after the invention of photography. Over 4,000 photographs comprise the Holterman Photographic Collection. As you would expect, Holterman took over the lens himself and proof is in his world trips. These photos were taken by Holterman while crossing the equator on board a cutter named Bismarck. Easy to lose sight when the focus is everything. He was a multitasker, first and foremost a gold seeker. After his death, in 1885, gold leases were still being granted in his name, his motto being Fair rich deposits have been found there, look for more. All throughout, his gold seeking never stopped. He dug for gold at Pine Creek in the Northern Territory, Charters Towers in Queensland, and many sites like Mullion Creek and Browns Creek in New South Wales, prospecting south into Victoria. Too many occupations to mention, including an alderman on the Hill End Borough Council, later becoming a member for the New South Wales Legislative Assembly for St Leonard's. Excerpts from his 1874 diary confirm an exhausting lifestyle. He imported all manner of goods, furniture, 
American soaps, beer, machinery, sewing machines, gas producer plants, telegraphic equipment, refrigerating paint, and more. The catalyst for all this came from Hill and Gold. With the aid of surviving records, we can now recall events that shaped history. Hawkins Hill, back in the year 1872, and the star of Hope Mine is the double-storey building. As a little bit of trivia, there's a mining accessory you don't see every day, an oh and approved nugget release box, complete with ore disposal chute. In March 1872, using their original claim, Byers and Halterman formed a company, with Halterman acting as above-ground mine manager and retaining 25%, while Byers played no further active role. Later in mid-spring, a scheduled crushing from the Star of Hope mine had begun at the Pullen and Rawsthorne Stamper Battery. The rush was in full swing, when newspapers recorded unusual activities. Saturday, 12th October, 1872. The heaviest fall of snow ever seen in the district occurred on Friday morning. Locals woke to 18 inches of snow and a view that was quite English. A few days later, on the evening of the 18th, an earthquake shook everyone awake just before 7 o'clock. Halterman's 25% shareholding didn't buy sole rights to the find, and crushing was in progress. He could see the benefits of keeping the specimen intact for posterity, but outvoted, this was not to be. His dreams crushed, with a total yield of 15,488 ounces and 11 pennyweights of gold. It was back to work. Buyer's doorway right, Alfred Bullock in the centre and Halterman on the left. If it wasn't for Halterman's far-sighted ideology, this might all be conjecture. The proof is in the surviving documents and photographs, leaving no doubt to a time when people partied, gold flowed, and a town sung the praises of B.O. Halterman. <laughs>